Okay, welcome everyone to the last session of this conference. It's my great pleasure to introduce Rajiv Rahman. Um, he received his PhD from the University of Rochester in New York, and after that, like went across the Atlantic a couple of times, working as a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, then at the Maryland Institute of Advanced Studies in the US, and then at the King's College in London, and now like more like now more than 20 years he is at the University of Leicester in the UK. His research interests are are quite diverse and broadly summarized by algorithms and complexity. So he is working in the area of data structure design uh, mostly and will us today tell us, I think, about succinct data structures, which have an increasing range of application. And today's talk has the title Counting on Saving Space. So please, Ojeev, stage is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. I just wanted to say, first of all, uh, I mean, it's a, a slightly uh, I, sh I should have I should have been a bit bolder at the time of uh, the, in the, the at the time Mark invited me and, and agreed to come on over because um, honestly it's uh, it's such a pleasure to be able to 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 attend uh, this this conference and to to talk to this community um, as as I mentioned to Mark when he when he asked me to give this uh, invited presentation um, it's not really I'm not really an AFA person as such or whatever that might be. Um, but at the same time, I do find the work put out by this community to be um, extremely useful and interesting. And uh, there's always uh, something new that I learned from reading these papers. So it's it's been my it's really my pleasure to to come here and and to to give this talk. Um, yeah. So uh, what I'd like to do is so this this uh, I would also maybe uh, like to say that this is going to be. Uh, as Mark mentioned, one of my main areas of interest is succinct data structures. Um, and this is going to be an introduction to succinct data structures. So there are a few people uh, I can see in the audience, including uh, Sebastian and uh, Jeremy, uh, who are sort of, who have a foot in both camps. Um, so there is a um, uh, people who know about succinct data structures and about uh, AFA stuff. Uh, for them, I think this talk isn't really um, just trying to tell you in advance, this talk is not aimed at you guys. It, it's aimed at everyone else who hasn't seen succinct data structures before. So uh, feel free to mute me, feel free to leave. Uh, that, 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 that's all. That's all. I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't be terribly insulted if you choose, choose to do that. So, but uh, because this is this is a, a, an AFA talk, uh, I will be basically um, not be talking anything at all about data structures. Um, and I'm going to um, focus on the relation of succinct data structures to counting, um, especially through this idea of encoding data structures. So uh, if, if, if you feel that you really want to know more about succinct data structures, the, 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 all the gory details. Um, so we, we um, and there are many different ways of describing this. I'm going to use the word full English. Uh, full English basically means a full English breakfast, which basically means a very large an extremely um, uh, diverse and 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 uh, you know to keep you going for a very long time. If you want to learn, if you want the full English of succinct data structures, then um, please please do take a look at this excellent book by um, by Gonzalo, who was the invited, who was the plenary speaker about a couple of uh, days ago at AFA. So yeah, uh, so so this isn't about it. Isn't really going to be about succinct data structures as such. It's just some kind of um, some loosely, um, it, it is about succinct data structures, but it isn't about succinct data structures. That's slightly confusing, but but I think people who know uh, succinct data structures will realize what I'm trying to say. Okay, yeah. So just a very quick quick summary of what data structures are. The first, the data structure, the, the idea is you have some input data, and what you have to do is you have to pre-process the input data, and uh, the pre-processing can is supposed to be fairly extensive, and then you have a long series of query or update operations. So, um, so the idea is that uh, by doing this pre-processing, you can sort of do the query and update operations later on a lot faster. So what you want to do is you want to minimize uh, the query and update time. Um, certainly one of the things that we're going to focus on quite a lot is the space usage of the data structure. Uh, there is a hidden assumption over here, which I'd like to make explicit, uh, is that the idea is that when you do a query, 
uh, clearly the computer is going to use some temporary working space and we assume that this temporary working space isn't sort of you know crazy large okay um uh, that sort of, sort of rules out some of the more um sort of uh, crazy ideas like you sort of uh, somehow reconstruct the data completely on the fly as soon as as you get a query that that kind of stuff is kind of disallowed um the next thing that's also of interest uh, in general in data structures is is the time for pre-processing and and for example the space for pre-processing yeah so these are all of interest to us um so uh, one, one of the things that we, we we want sort of I want to sort of start off by pointing out that there is there is a um, slight uh, conflict between uh, compression and data structuring. So the idea is that if you want to support operations on data, uh, this requires you you can't just have the data most of the time unless your data is extremely simple. Most of the time, in addition to this data, you have some kind of index or some additional information that allows you to find. The data in that that allows you to um, answer a particular query. Uh, the problem is that this index can sometimes be larger than the data. So, for example, there is a data structure called the range trees. Uh, it's supposed to um, answer something called 2D orthogonal range queries and endpoints. I, I won't tell you what the, that is right now. If you don't know, that's fine. But the main point about it is, although it 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 does, you've got endpoints, and endpoints should be order of n space. But the data structure itself takes order of n log n words of space. If you so, therefore, what's happened is that in order to answer these queries, you've actually magnified the space usage. Uh, another one, another sort of favorite example, one of the starting motivations for for many of the work on on succinct data structures is this data structure called the suffix tree. It's a very famous data structure. So for for indexing a sequence of symbols, uh, the alphabet size is sigma. Um, it, it, it works really well now. And the thing is it says it takes order of n words of space. Now you might think order of n words of space is very good. You've got n symbols. But uh, one of the things that happens is that uh, we have to look at this exactly what order of n words of space means. Um, so one of the things that we make, we assume over here is that a single word must have at least log base two of n bits. Uh, and that's just to say that um, the number, if you have an input of size n, the number n should fit into a single word. Um, and that's sort of to aid with some of the uh, complexity analyses and so on and so forth, yeah. So as a result, what that means is that um, if you have order of n words or theta of n words, uh, this basically means it's n log n bits. Um, but the, the sequence itself is n log sigma bits and sigma is, is the size of the alphabet. So uh, just to give you a straight example, a st standard example, uh, if you happen to have a uh, a sequence of two billion, um, you know, it's like a genomic sequence of length, say two billion, then the alphabet size is just four. So each letter in the alphabet can be written using just two bits. But then, if your data structure takes big O of n words, then it's very likely that that this is going to be a lot, lot bigger than the original sequence. So on the practical side. Uh, even a very good implementation of suffix trees will take something like 10 to 30 times the more space than than this uh, than the text itself, and that that's not very good because uh, uh, you know the kinds of um, queries, the kinds of stuff that you have to do with suffix trees, uh, these are not very suitable for. Uh, there, there's there's a fair amount of work of of trying to put these onto hard disk or something where space is an issue, but. For a lot of things you want to do with suffix trees, it's much better if the suffix tree were actually held in memory. And uh, if you suddenly sort of blow up the space usage of uh, to something like 10 to 30 times your data, then um, it's it just makes it very hard to hold this data structure in memory. Uh, so yeah, so so the, so the main point in succinct or compressed data structures is that we sort of try to separate out these two concepts. One is the space which is used for the data itself and, and the space for the index. And the space for the index is something that we call the redundancy, which is also used um, in, in, this is what we call redundancy. And I do appreciate that there, there are many, many sort of uh, different um, uh, in, you know, uses of this particular term, but, but we'll just mention, I won't be using this very often, so hopefully it won't, it won't confuse people too much. So the idea is that this, this additional space that you use beyond the space for the data should be asymptotically smaller than the space for the data. So basically, the, the space usage of your data structure is dominated 
by the space needed for your data. And one of the things that really sort of, uh, uh, one of the reasons, one of the important reasons why we are very concerned uh, with, with results from the AFA community is that uh, as far as the space is concerned, we, we, we do worry about the constant factors. So it's not enough to say big O of n bits. I'd like to know if it is it two n bits or is it four n bits? And the reason is very obvious. You know, if, if, if it's a data structure using two n bits uses precisely half the memory of data structure of, of, uh, of, of four n bits, yeah? So, uh, and that it may be that your four n doesn't fit into, into your memory, whereas two n does fit into your memory. So one of the things that I'd like to point out, I'll just mention this once. After this, we can ignore this particular bullet point. I won't talk about any of the real world applications, but SDS do have lots and lots of real world applications, especially in bioinformatics. Uh, uh, you know, I think uh, Gonzalo's talk was would have um, told you about uh, you know applications and databases and so on. So the database community also want to look at these things and so on and so forth. Okay, so 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 in this talk, I'm going to ignore everything I care about. Okay, I care about update operations. It's a big thing for me. I'm going to talk about it. Query time is pretty much my bread and butter. I'm not going to talk about it. Time of pre-processing, space for pre-processing. This is something I've been interested in recently. I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, so we're just going to worry about space. And this, this basically frees you from, from um, those of you who, who, who don't want to see the all the um, messiness of succinct data structures. Um, I believe I have a paper where I I use the fact that log, 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 log of n divided by log, 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 log of n is asymptotically going to zero as n goes to infinity. So it, you, got, you, got, you got messy formulae like that. And so um, um, you should be very pleased that I'm, I'm, I'm sparing you uh, all of this stuff. Okay, so um, one of, one of the first places where, where uh, stuff from AFA comes in is, is something called the information theoretic lower bound. So this, this, I just want to come back over here, is this, the question is, when we say space for data, what is the space for the data? Yeah. So, um, so the claim is that, uh, so the obvious, uh, couple of um, obvious, uh, there's a slight, uh, there's a comment out here that my internet connection is unstable. So if at any point my voice is, is going out, please, please do. Um, uh, feel free to interrupt me, yeah? So, so the idea is that if you're choosing an object from a set S, then in the worst case, you need log base of size of S bits to represent X. Uh, or if you sort of uh, take a set S and you draw an object from it according to some probability distribution, then the, uh, according to, by, by Shannon's theorem, the, the, uh, the minimum number of bits that you need to encode this is something like log base to one divided by the probability of X, yeah? So uh, just to give an example, if, if, if you decide that X is a, is a binary tree of N nodes, then S is the set of all binary trees of, of N nodes. And uh, roughly speaking, if you take log base two of S, that's two N bits minus a small amount, okay? And uh, this next bullet point is slightly imprecise. I apologize for that. Uh, but the idea is that, for example, if, if, this, if this tree were to, if you were to take this, this, this binary tree and you were to do it by random insertions of, if it's a binary tree that correspond to random insertions of keys uh, in, into, into a search tree, well, then this, this one, for example, the expected number of bits that you need for this is something like uh, 1.736 n bits. So that's 2 n and 1.736 n bits. And the question is, you know, what, what, why is this sort of, why does this, Get very, why, why does this get practical people very excited? Uh, so the, for example, is that if you take a normal, if you take a normal representation of a binary tree, so you typically have a node and you have a pointer to a left child, a right child, perhaps to a parent or something like that. So you basically need a constant number of pointers per node and each pointer is basically going to be a, uh, the has to be at least the same size in, in, in the computer as a machine word. And we said that a machine word takes log n bits so therefore uh, you're using n log n bits, but the succinct binary tree is just taking, for example, two n bits or even less. So, uh, so you can see that this is a huge improvement in terms of the memory in practice, yeah? So this is why people get very, that when you can use succinct data structures, they make a big, big impact. Okay, so this is uh, the first, the very first thing that I want to sort of talk about, and uh, Sebastian, this is where, this is where uh, uh, something from your paper comes in. Um, so the, there's two reasons why um, counting 
of objects is extremely useful for us. Okay, the first is that uh, we have this information theoretic lower bound. And for example, in this case, we have this very well known formula, the Catalan number for the number of binary trees, but this is a counting formula. And what, what, this, what this really helps us is that it tells us that this is the bound, 2n bits is roughly the bound that we need to aim for, and that's basically going to be optimal. So um, what this means is that the information theoretic lower bound gives us a target, okay? Okay, um, the second thing is that the information theoretic lower bound also gives you a not very useful, but at least a um, naive, and space efficient representation of an object. Okay, so what, what is this naive and space efficient um, representation of the object? It is exactly what you think it is. Uh, you have somebody gives you a binary tree, you dis discover it has n nodes, you think of an enumeration of all possible n nodes, and you say uh, all possible n node binary trees, and you say, oh, the binary tree that you gave me is this particular one. This, this particular index in this huge list of, of, of uh, binary trees, and you represent your binary tree exactly as that index, okay? So that isn't, of course, very useful because if I want to do anything with the binary tree, like navigate it to something, uh, th there is no, um, there is nothing in this representation that's going to help you. But at the same time, what this means is that, as I wanted to sort of discuss is that this is a very, it's actually fairly common kind of uh, approach in many succinct data structures. And why this, this a very, very, so all I'm trying to say over here, the motivation of this slide is that the one of the things that a lot of researchers in the A of A community do is to, just to give closed form expressions for the number of, of the, you know, the, the, the amount, the, the uh, some kind of closed form expression for counting a particular kind of object. I'm just saying just, just, just that formula alone is going to lead to a more efficient succinct data structure with, 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 the well, with, with the bound. And you know, if the object is interesting enough, it might actually end up being used in practice, just that formula alone. So, so, so the idea is that, uh, so this is, the, this is a very standard approach. It's a, it's a very common uh, SDS uh, approach is you, you're given your object X and N is again, the size of this object. We somehow decompose X into some small smaller blocks, uh, which is, uh, each block, we can, let's call a block B. And let's assume somehow that this block B has the same properties of X, okay? So, uh, and so let's give a couple of examples. So if X is, is a string of symbols output by a memory-less source, uh, then a block could just be, just take any substring of symbols here, okay? So I take, a, say, the first to the hundred symbols in this, in this string, uh, this is a block. And this is going to have the same properties because, you know, it's, for example, if in terms of the frequency distribution of symbols, the block B is going to look exactly the same as, as the original string. Uh, if you have, for example, um, a, if X is a string of symbols output by a kth order Markov source, um, well, then it's almost exactly the same. Uh, if you, especially if you sort of uh, assume that the, the order of the Markov source is much smaller than the size of this block. And those first two, for example, are, are used, um, uh, honestly, I, 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 I think the number of papers that use these, these first two, the, the, the first two facts um, is probably in the thousands by now. Okay, so, so, so it, it is, this is a very well understood um, um, idea. One of the things that is a very nice paper uh, by Munro et al, which was published last year, and Sebastian is one of the co-authors of this, is that if you think of X as being a tree output by several classes of tree generators, you can do exactly the same thing. You can, you, can, you, you, can, you can break it up into blocks and each of these blocks is actually going to be uh, somehow, it's going to be enough like the original tree that, that you, can, you can do a lot of things with it, okay? So uh, once, once, once you have this decomposition into blocks, then the, if you continue this SDS cookbook, this is the only place where we get any of the hairy details of succinct data structures, so just bear with me. So we choose the size of this block so that the information theoretic lower bound representation. So what's the information theoretic lower bound representation? It just says that you know you have a, you have a block, you know the number of uh, you know the size of this block, and what you do is you think of some kind of enumeration of all objects of this particular size, and your block has to be somewhere in this uh, in this enumeration. And the representation of this block is just, oh, you're the 450th uh, 
uh, you know, object in this enumeration. So I'm just going to take this number 450, write it out in, in the right number of bits, and that's my representation of this particular block. So what we do is we choose the size of the block so that the information theoretic representation of the information, ITLB representation of this block uses less than this funny number, one quarter of log base two of n bits, okay? One quarter is slightly arbitrary, of course, but, but so now what we need to do is, one of the things we want to do is we want rapid queries on, the, on X. So one thing we just want to do is we want to operate rapidly on B. So, um, one operation, for example, is that if supposing your object B, your block B also happens to be a tree or a tree-like object, then one question that you might want to ask if you want to say, navigate through this tree is that, well, here's, here's a string that somehow represents a tree. Uh, let's assume that the nodes of this tree are, are numbered say in pre-order, then let's take node number 25 in pre-order. What is the pre-order numbering of the parent of node number 25? Okay, so that's a perfectly valid query that you can ask of this particular, um, this block B. But this block B is actually just a number. So uh, what's, what, what's, what sort of the solution to this? The solution to this is something called, a, it's, it's, it's called the four Russians um, uh, 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 trick. And the idea is you take this representation of B, which is a bit string of log base two of N bits, so again, remember uh, that we assume that n fits into a single integer. So this, this whole representation is just an integer. Now we take this integer and we have this, we, in the pre-processing state, we create this very large, not, not actually very large, large-ish array, which contains one entry for every possible uh, object that would be represented by this bit string. And what happens is in the pre-computation phase, we, we basically pre-compute the answers to all possible questions. Okay, and the whole point about this this trick is that the number of possible uh, number of possible uh, objects that you would have to represent in each array is actually relatively small. It's two raised to the one fourth of log base two of n, which is something like um, n to the one fourth. So n to the one fourth is considered negligible compared to the size of the data, which is assumed to be somehow proportional to n. Okay, so 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 this so this size of this table is actually negligible. And what this means is that in order to answer any kind of uh, query on this particular block, if you want to operate on this block, for every possible operation, you just need one such table. And the operation is just a matter of going to this table, looking up an entry in this table, and you're done. So it's a constant time operation. It's extremely fast. So after this, the, the rest of the stuff, the next bullet point is where the meat of most succinct data structures papers is, is you have to answer queries on X. So somehow or the other, hopefully you manage to, um, to, to, to with a lot, of, uh, a lot of grunt work, you, you, use a, you create an index which is relatively small, uh, again, of negligible size, and then you somehow reduce queries on X two queries on a block. Um, and if you blocking, if, you, if, you, if the way you create your blocks is somewhat clever, then the number of blocks is relatively small. It's actually sublinear in N. And that basically is what gives you the, the ability to have these indices, which also are sublinear in N bits, okay? So the idea then is that, so this is the complete cookbook. The cookbook is you, you break your thing up into little pieces. Uh, you encode each piece somehow using a very naive um, representation, but using the counting formula to, to then bound the space usage of this representation. Then you spend a lot of time creating a very compact index. Then you go to an index, find the right block, and then operate on the block with a single table lookup. And, and that you're basically done. And in this particular case, if you do it this way and you're successful in this, in this, in this second to last bullet point over here, then the, the space usage of the entire data structure is dominated by just the encodings of these blocks. And what's great about and what has this got to do with the, with, the, um, with the A of A community? So pretty much if we were to write a paper saying what the space usage of a data structure is, we have to go to your paper, okay? If you've, if you've, if you've written a paper on counting the number of objects of a particular kind, go to your paper, get that, get, get that formula, and that tells us how long these, these bit strings are gonna be we add them all up and that's going to give us the space usage. And that's going to be the headline number in our paper. So, so, so this, all I'm trying to say here is this, this kind of recipe is a very direct, very direct line from 
the uh, from the counting formula directly to to to, to a paper. Yeah. So so this is the uh, SDS cookbook, and therefore again, I just want to repeat myself. You know, most of the stuff that you guys do, uh, all, all the people who do the counting kind of work, uh, we we just love it, and it's it's all extremely useful to us. Okay. Um, so uh, so this is a very direct, and what I'd like to do is perhaps um, this area which which I was working on for the last few years called called encodings. And I'm kind of uh, going to sort of go off a little bit on a slightly, it's a slightly specialized sub area of, of, of uh, succinct data structures. But I believe that the, the, this, is, this, this, data, this area sort of raises some very interesting counting problems. And my hope is that, you know, I can get you guys interested in some of these counting problems. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah, so like I said, any counting result on an interesting object is often useful to us. Uh, but now we're going to look at encoding data structures and the, the, the purpose of encoding data structures is that we like them in the SDS community because encoding data structures allow us to compress data. You get a compressed data structure for data which would otherwise be incompressible, okay? And our focus is going to be on so-called order queries on um, 1D and 2D arrays of numbers. And that's pretty much the um, rest of this talk. So I'm just gonna try to make sure I don't, um, yeah, it's, uh, okay, so good. So I, I, I realized that this, this uh, I, what, I was going, what I thought was gonna be a five minute introdu introduction to such thing data structures has, has actually, is going to actually take, has taken significant amount of my time. So, so Mark, please, please do uh, make sure you give me your 10 minute warning and so on and so forth, yeah. Okay, so uh, the very first, so well, just to introduce this, uh, I would like to introduce a very famous problem called the RMQ problem. So what's the RMQ problem? Uh, so what you have is you're given a static array um, of n numbers. And what you have to do is you have to pre-process A to answer these following queries. The query is RMQ, and it has two arguments, L and R. And the, the uh, answer returned by this query is to return the maximum um, value in this array uh, within those that lie in the subarray specified by the indices L and R. So for example, RMQ 510 is 85, because if you go from position five to 10, then 85 is the, is the largest value in there, okay? Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a very, very, very well-studied problem and uh, everyone knows about it. And uh, so this, uh, there's a very famous uh, data structure called the Cartesian tree. And I'll very briefly introduce the Cartesian tree because, because I need to talk about this. So the Cartesian tree of this array is, is obtained as follows. Uh, we put the largest value of this array, which is 97 at the root of the tree. And then what we do is we recurse on the uh, subarrays to the, to the right and to the left. And the, the, the root of the tree of the subarray on the right becomes the right child of the root and so on and so forth, yeah. So here, for example, if you recurse on this subarray, we get 85, 85 goes over here and we continue in this fashion and we get this particular, um, uh, this particular uh, binary tree. And it's a very well-known fact that if you want to answer the RMQ, so you, what you do is you've got this uh, range of uh, arrays over a range of numbers over here. You find 46 over here, you find 18 over here, and you take the lowest common ancestor inside the tree. And that basically gives you the RMQ, the answer to the RMQ question. Okay, so the, the thing about, the, so, it, so it turns out that the, 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 there, is, there is a, this, this, this problem has been studied for like over 30, 40 years. There's, there's, uh, there's no shortage of, 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 of data structures that take order of n space and answer RMQ queries in constant time. Okay, so this is a very well studied problem. The problem is that um, th this, this, this order of n space is actually a bit too much because as we mentioned before, order of n space means order of n words, which is n log n bits, okay? Um, so unfortunately, like I've also already mentioned before as well, n log n bits is sometimes too much. So for example, if I want to have a suffix array uh, over a say bit string or something like that, then the suffix array itself can be uh, represented using uh, a very sophisticated data structure called a compressed suffix data structure in order of n bits. So the thing is, it turns out if you take suffix arrays and a something called an LCP array, so what's an LCP array? What you have to do is um, you take two consecutive suffixes of your original string 
and you take the longest common prefix of two consecutive uh, suffixes in the in the in the uh, two lexicographically successive um, suffixes in the original string, and you write all the all these lengths of all these longest common prefix down. So that's called an LCP array. So it turns out that if you take the, the compressed suffix array and you have this LCP array and you're sub able to support RMQ queries on this LCP array, then you can do all sorts of wonderful things. You can pretty much have uh, the suffix free data structure itself. So that, that's really nice. But the problem here now is that we have these data structures for the RMQ uh, on an array, which basically take uh, n log n bits, whereas the suffix array is just taking order of n bits now. So we're this 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 additional data structure uh, for for assisting with the suffix array is now taking more space than the original array. So yeah, so the thing is that um, unfortunately, if you think well, what should be the space usage for this a, um, well, you can actually reconstruct the entire array a um, using these RMQ queries because you can just basically ask for ranges that that give you an individual entry of the array. So you can just get every single entry of the array. And in general, A could, for example, be a permutation of one to N. So it's, 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 it's uh, you can't expect to compress A. So the, the way to do better is to slightly change the uh, definition of the problem. So what you do, you're saying that RNQLR is no longer the, um, it's no longer the actual maximum value, but you ask for the index where the maximum value is to be found, okay? So here, for example, uh, RMQ 510 now that returns the answer eight and not 85, because in the range of indices five to 10, the largest value is actually found at position uh, eight, okay? And it turns out that in many of the applications of RMQs, especially the, the, the application that I mentioned with this LCP array, you don't actually need the value. You can always, if you need, if you need a particular value of AFI, you can, AF, this, this, this in the LCP, for example, AFI is derived from the input string. So uh, if you need a value of AFI, you could actually just go to the input string and somehow rederive it if you really want to. Okay, that's a slight simplification, but 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 uh, but hopefully the, the the point becomes clear. Okay, yeah. So so therefore, uh, the but the RMQ data structure is still very useful for finding the position where the largest value occurs. Okay, so if you want only want the position over here, then what's really nice is that. Um, if you were to, for example, take this 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 um, this uh, this tree, uh, the uh, just uh, the, the way it's it's set up, the the, the pre-order um, numbering of the, of this of this of this tree, uh, sorry, the, uh, the the in order numbering of this tree is precisely the order is precisely the index at where at where, where the corresponding value is found. So. Um, if I have this particular tree over here, then at least um, there's a slight technicality about you know the, the the numbering of nodes and so on and so forth. I don't want to get into that right now, uh, but but broadly speaking, if, if once I have the, this this the shape of this tree, then that suffices to answer RMQ queries, okay? Because uh, so we don't need the array A at all, and as we already said, this is a binary tree with n nodes, so it can actually be encoded using um, two n bits. The information theory lower bound slightly smaller, but but you can there's a very simple and uh, obvious encoding of this using two n bits, which is uh, what we do is we just uh, visit all these nodes, for example, in in pre order. So first we visit node three. Uh, this node has two children, so we write down one one, for example. Then we come to this node one over here. This doesn't have a left child, has a right child, so we write zero, one, and so on and so forth. So this is an encoding of this tree. It's a concrete encoding, and you can see that from this, you can from this bit string, you can actually recover the tree. So in principle, after some data structural hacking, if I just give you this particular bit string, I can now answer RMQ queries on, on that original array. Yeah, so that's really nice. Okay, um, so this is the uh, uh, very rough idea of encoding data structures. You've got the input, you do some pre-processing, and then you come up with an encoding of, of the of the of the um, of the data structure, and now all queries can be answered directly by looking at the encoding, and you can actually delete the input. Okay, um, and obviously this this thing is only interesting if the encoding is significantly smaller than the input. Uh, so yeah, so we have to look at problems where the encoding of the problem is much smaller than the input. 
Okay, so uh, so just to sort of uh, uh, sort of slightly, uh, I want to also very briefly mention that so there's this notion of effective entropy. So encoding is something called is is related to something. Well, this term effective entropy is something that that we came up with. If somebody tells me that there's a better way of calling it, I don't like the term myself. But 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 yeah. Um, so the idea is that. So entropy, you can sort of think of as the information content of the data. Uh, effective entropy is somehow the information content of the data structure. Uh, again, I've had complaints about my using the word data structure over here, but the idea is that uh, just ignore this, this stuff in ports. Uh, let's just go straight down here. So given a set of objects S, so information theoretic lower bound says that you need log base two of S bits uh, in order to encode an object, okay? But now you're given a set of S, objects S, and a set of queries Q. And now what happens is the queries, depend if for the right kind of queries, um, you have the objects are divided into equivalence classes. And uh, so the idea is that two objects are equivalent if they cannot be distinguished by queries that you could possibly ask. So if you're doing RMQ queries, and you have these two arrays one, three, and two, and two, three, and one, there's no way for you to distinguish uh, what the original array was. Because remember the RMQ query has been modified to just give you the position of the uh, largest value in the range, yeah? Um, so therefore arrays A and B cannot be distinguished by RMQ queries. And therefore you can imagine that the, the size of this equivalence class could potentially be considerably smaller than the, uh, than the um, uh, original set of objects. So we want to now store X, our uh, object X, uh, not in the size, uh, not in the size of uh, log of size of S, but in log of size of the equivalence class. Okay, and you can also define expected and effective entropy. And I'm not going to go down that right now. Okay, so if you come over here, uh, sorry. So so this basically shows the, so the previous RMQ uh, uh, slide basically shows that the because the uh, the RMQ queries are, are completely encoded by this Cartesian tree. It shows that the effective entropy of, of the RMQ, if you take an array and you ask for the effective entropy of RMQ, that is precisely the number of distinct binary trees on N nodes. So that's quite nice. So uh, what I wanted to do was to talk about uh, now, um, I'm not sure you can actually, are you able to see the very top of my slide? So the, so the next next part of my talk is, 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 is something called, friends of RMQ. So this, this is a kind of set of problems. Um, some of these problems are motivated by, again, in, um, problems in, test in, in text indexing. Uh, others, it's not so clear what their motivations are, but I just had an enor enormous amount of fun working on these problems. And I think they're, they're wonderful problems to, to uh, pure combinatorial problems for, for people to, to look at. So, um, so here's the very first of these of these problems. Um, this is uh, again quite closely related to the RMQ problem, um, and again, like I said, very similar problems like this are are used in in many uh, text indexing um, uh, problems. So uh, now, what, again, you have this array a one to n, and in our in our work right now, we'll just assume that these these values are all distinct. So we have to encode a to answer this particular query, which is NLVI. So what is NLVI? It's supposed to encode the nearest larger value. So the, I, the formal definition is you have to return, again, the objective is not to, we're doing encoding, so we don't want to sort of return the actual values, but we want to return the index such that, um, uh, sorry, this should be return J, beg your pardon. Yeah, so return J, such that a of j is larger than a of i. So find a value which is, you, you're given a particular position, like for example, NLV of six. So here's, here's the position six over here. So now we have to look at what are the values that are larger than six. Well, the, one of the values that's larger than six is this eight. There's this one, 10, nine, 11. And what we have to do is we have all these, we have to find the one that's closest in the array to, to, to uh, uh, to this position six. Okay, so uh, here uh, because this is uh, this has got three intervening things, this is only two. 
Therefore, the NLV of six is basically three over here, okay? So, um, so now, of course, you might ask what happens if you had like, you know, another larger value at exactly two positions away over here. So you might, you might choose to, for example, say that if that is the case, always go to the one on the right, always go to the one on the left. Or you might say that, for example, if assuming that eight were over here, you might say, well, this is 11 and this is eight, so I'm going to return the 11 or something like that. There's a whole, whole variety of tie-breaking rules that you can have. So it turns out that you know, NLVs are, are, are well studied for very good reasons. If you have NLVs in both directions, you can get that from the, of course, if you want both directions, you can get that easily from the Cartesian tree. So, uh, so for example, if in the Cartesian tree, if you, have the, um, if you have this value over here, so this is a node, so that's a particular value in the array. So we all know that we know that in the Cartesian tree, that the left subtree and the right subtree are all values which are smaller than this, so they're uninteresting. Uh, but the nearest larger value to the left is basically the is be, so in this particular case, this happens to be the right child of, of its parent. So if this is the, in that case, the, the the nearest larger value to the left is actually the parent, and the nearest uh, larger value to the to the to the right is basically what we do is we go to the parent. The parent happens to be a I'm the right child of my parent. If the parent also happens to be a right child, then you just continue up until we find a node that is the um, left child of its parent. And that particular node is the nearest value to the right, okay? Nearest larger value to the right. So, so if you have the Cartesian tree, you can go in both directions, but, but the problem is that um, if you want, uh, NL, if, you, if, you, if you make a data structure that, that gives you NLVs in both directions, that's exactly equal to the RMQ, and therefore you can't hope to get any space savings, okay? So, one of the reasons we hoped was that, again, if you look at the equivalence class of NLV queries, if you just say, give it in one direction, then, then, then we thought that we could save some space. So, um, so the basic idea that we have is that we start off with the Cartesian tree. And then what we do is we, we try to um, do a little bit of surgery on the Cartesian tree uh, to, to remove some, some, some features in the Cartesian tree without changing the, uh, without changing the answer to the queries. Okay, so supposing we have this situation over here and we have, so we have uh, like a zigzag path. What's a zigzag path? A zigzag path is, is you know, a series of nodes of degree one where, where you alternate between left and right children. So, um, so the claim is that if this is the case, then we could actually change the Cartesian tree. We could change this tree to a slightly different Cartesian tree of a slightly different array and we would still get exactly the same answers. Okay, and to do this, you, what you have to observe is that uh, this, this particular node and these two, these two nodes are adjacent and these two nodes are adjacent in the array. And uh, this node, for example, is not adjacent to this node because there's this whole subtree in between. So for example, the, uh, the answer for, for the uh, nearest larger value for, for this particular node has to be this node over here. And for this node, it has to be that node over there. So what this means is that we can actually change this, the structure of the tree so that uh, instead of saying that the, we, we basically say that the parent of this node is this node over here and the parent of this node is this node over here. So what this do, what, what, what this basically does is you can just sort of take this, this particular tree uh, in terms of the values, you're basically increasing this value over here, decreasing this value. And then you get, you get something that looks like this. And the main thing over here is that this particular tree now, uh, there isn't this, this zigzag, uh, this, there, there is no longer zigzag, there's no longer a zigzag path. Okay, so, um, Rajiv, so what we do now is- Rajiv, yeah. can you hear us? Yes. You asked, us, you asked us to give you a 10 minute warning. So it's quarter till the hour. So if you talk 10 more minutes, it gives us five minutes for questions. Okay, that, that's great. So. Um, so, so, the, so the claim over here is that um, I'm gonna change the encoding of degree one nodes. Um, so in, instead of just previously, this used to be called B and this used to be called C. We're gonna just take all degree one nodes and see if they give a zig. If there's a turn in here, then we're going to call, uh, we, we're going to call it a B. And if there is no turn in, and that is to say, you've got one degree one node, which is the right child of, of, of and also has a right child, then we call it a C, for example, okay? So, um, uh, so what this means is that uh, if you have such a thing, then we we take this encoding of, of the the previous encoding that you have the binary tree, and what this means is by by making this particular surgery, we have identified a certain pattern 
of, of symbols that cannot appear in the string, okay? Because what we're saying, if it does appear, we can change the, 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 the binary tree so that it, 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 it is no longer there and the queries are gonna be exactly the same. So uh, what we do is, and then, uh, so uh, we also had this other idea that you could also uh, change the, 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 um, the um, you could also, you could also sort of avoid this kind of situation where you have a, uh, a leaf, which is uh, right below a, 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 a zig uh, degree one node, okay? And what this means is that you now have a, a, a string over the alphabet A, B, C, D, where these patterns are forbidden. And what we can do is we can count this. So I'm gonna go over this really quickly because you know just create this automaton. This is an automaton that accepts all strings except, um, except uh, those containing those two patterns over there. And uh, this is, uh, you can just basically uh, get this particular uh, value out by, by just, um, uh, just the ith entry of this, of, of, of the of, uh, ijth entry of, of, um, uh, of the, basically the one fourth entry of this particular matrix is, is, is precisely the, uh, is precisely the, um, um, the generative function for, for, for the number of these strings over here. And this, this gives you this particular value. So, I mean, all I'm trying to say is that this, this is just something that we tried and there's little A of A flavor to it. Uh, I, I would say that um, we are nowhere near sort of exploring everything that we could explore. Uh, one thing we did, we did try was computational experiments, trying to see the number of distinct configurations. And we got these numbers over here. And uh, we looked up these sequences in the uh, online en encyclopedia of integer sequences and we couldn't find them. Uh, we conjectured that, for example, these sequence should be three to the n. That would be really nice. Unfortunately, it's not three to the n, uh, but it's, it's certainly, it, so the point over here is that this number is 1.62. And uh, this 1.62 is very far from what we have 1.81. And yeah, so, so I think somebody who can actually count these number of uh, distinguishable configurations is going to automatically improve this particular, this, this bound over here. Uh, so in addition to this uh, nearest larger value, there is uh, another problem, which is um, uh, bi-directional nearest value left and right. Um, but this time we allow sort of duplicates over here. And this means that uh, the original um, uh, Cartesian tree doesn't, doesn't quite sort of uh, uh, work. Uh, and uh, and uh, this is a paper by, by Fisher et al. And the, uh, it turns out that this is completely characterized by these so-called Schroeder trees. And from that, you get this number of two point. So all I'm trying to say is from this result that says the number of Schroeder trees is this, we get this number of 2.54 N in, 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 the, in the actual com the space usage of our data structure. And another one, there's, there's this, this other paper over here where we try to do all four of these. So you want to go to either to the left or to the right and to pick either larger or smaller values. And, and this problem has also been studied, okay? So, um, so since I'm sort of short of time, I'm just going to uh, briefly um, indicate now the, the, the other kinds of problems that people have studied in this space. Um, so this was just, uh, these are just these problems of nearest of, of, of larger values in left or right direction. So this, again, counting these, the, counting the number of, of distinct configurations is something that I mean, so this, this, this result is two plus log base two of three, log base two of 17. Honestly, if, if, if somebody looks at this problem and says that log base two of 17 is the right answer, um, I, I will officially eat a hat, okay? So this is clearly not the right answer. This is just the best that, that they could do in terms of an upper bound of an encoding, yeah? So yes, yeah, so this is basically an encoding. It's like actual saying, this is the way you encode uh, your array using two Schroeder trees, for example, and do something and you get log base 217 bits, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so uh, then after that, what we want to do is slightly generalize the range, um, um, the RMQ problem. So let's take a look at some generalizations for that. And uh, there's something called a range min max. So if I, I give you a range of values and you have to return both the largest and the smallest values, and it turns out that uh, these are completely characterized by something called Baxter permutations. Uh, so the idea is that if I have a Baxter permutation given to me in an array, then I can completely recover it using a range min max queries. So that gives you again an immediate lower bound as to as to how, how many bits it needs to 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 the number of Baxter permutations gives you a lower bound on the on the uh, number of bits needed to answer 
range min max queries and they gave an encoding. So uh, I don't want to go into that. The next one is, is uh, next problem that I want to very briefly mention is another generalization. It says, I give you a range and I don't care about the um, necessarily the largest value, but I want to look for example, for the second largest value. Okay, so, um, so you're given both this, this, this array and you're given like a number three. And you have to come up with a data structure that, that, that given the range will always return you the position of the third largest value in this, in this, in this range. So this is a, again, it's, a, it's just got, got the real excitement of the data structure and community and uh, lots of work on this from some very, very, very important people. Uh, but these were again, um, for the non info they basically were con considering linear space and, uh, and trying to get the best possible query time. So we looked at this problem as well. And, um, and so it turns out that, for example, if, if, um, if, you, um, um, if you think of the Cartesian tree and if I'm looking for the second largest uh, value, then the second largest value, if, 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 the, if, if the range, um, if, if this node, for example, is the largest value in its range, then the second one has to lie on one of these two spines, okay? So you go to the left and you go to the right, and you take the leftmost and rightmost spines of these two subtrees. And so if you take the Cartesian tree and augment it using the merging information for these two spines, then that is precisely the information you need for answering the second largest value in, the, in, the, in this array. Uh, third largest, it doesn't work like this. So I mean, I, I don't know what to do with third, third largest. So, uh, so, we, we, so, the, so there is, there, there is now a, a, an encoding for this, and this takes something like 2.76 n bits. Uh, this is not the, this is not the, uh, it's, it's a, I believe that there's still, it's not a uh, lower bound, so it's not, it's not optimal. So one can, one can hope for better encodings for this, for this as well. Um, so, okay, I, I won't, I won't sort of go into, into uh, these details right now. Um, uh, yeah, definitely not. So, yeah, so this lower, just, just, sorry. Um, yeah, so, so, yeah, so this is all very nice stuff, but, but I'm afraid I don't actually have time for this. So I, I think I'm going to just, just come to my, to my concluding slide over here. So my concluding slide is as following. So I hope, I hope that I, I, I tried to convince you that um, I really like um, results from the, uh, any kind of enumeration and counting results are extremely useful for us. Uh, they're, for, for anybody who works in such in data structures researchers. Um, like I said, the, uh, there are direct routes. So if you just have a pure counting result, that's absolutely fine. That pure counting result can actually give us a space bound to aim for. It can actually potentially result in, 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 uh, in results that directly just use your result to get, to get actually a real data structure for, for a potentially practical problem. Uh, and like I said, I think there are, Many counting problems that we encounter, I think, especially when it comes to encodings, uh, uh, you know, we try to look for characterizations of the things that we were trying to work with, and they're basically not out there. So, I, I think uh, this, these, 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 I'm, I'm, I've asked the A of A community several times uh, for these things, and the answers don't seem to be there. And like I said, we've searched for these sequences using. Uh, or, or the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, and they're not there either. So these are probably not very well known to you guys as well. And there's a whole number of other problems that we didn't manage to encoding problems that we didn't manage to, 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 um, to, to cover. So I think, so this is the easiest problem that I can think of, which is I have an array. This array is of length n. So one dimension is n, it's a two dimensional array, but it has two rows. Okay, and now what I what I do is I, I just give you any sub rectangle of this very long and thin array, and ask you to tell me where the largest value is. This is an extremely simple toy problem, but uh, honestly, nobody knows what the encoding complexity is. Um, there are some encodings, but but it's obvious that they're missing out some of the uh, some of the potential. Um, so two dimensional is just totally open in terms of finding. So in terms of the, the results in terms of asymptotic upper and lower bound, but in terms of actually uh, getting the constants right, uh, very little is known. Um, 
So, and then there are other things like range majority queries. So you've got, you've got like uh, arrays with duplicate values and you give ranges and you have to say, you know, what is the most common value in this, in this thing? Uh, something like order preserving matching, which is, which is also quite, quite, quite interesting where you, uh, where, where you, where you're not necessarily, you're trying to be, you're given a string of, or like a sequence of numbers and, and you're given a query, but you basically all have to, is to, is to, is to, um, find a subsequence which has the same up and down. So basically, if you just looked at the sorted permutation of the query and the sorted permutation of the sub of a particular subarray, if those two are equivalent, then you then you basically um, can uh, declare a match. And for this, it turns out you don't actually need to store the string itself. So you, uh, uh, there's a very nice encoding of, of strings for this. But again, what is the actual uh, complexity or exactly what is the number of these um, uh, different equivalence classes, absolutely nobody knows. So yeah, so that's basically all I wanted to say here, Moth. So um, uh, thank, thank you guys for your attention. Um, yeah. Um, hi, Rajiv. Uh, this is Conrado. Uh, hi, Conrado. Nice, nice to see you. Yeah. It was a very nice uh, talk. And I think I learned a few things. But of course, uh, uh, I want I have one question for you. Maybe it comes from my uh, not understanding my not understanding uh, the problem. But now, in the case of uh, uh, range minimum query, you yeah. encode or you you you, 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 you produce a Cartesian tree yeah. that will uh, allow you to to ask uh, to answer the query, and you are yeah. keeping the. It, the shape, that's the only thing that matters, right? Yeah, exactly. You yeah. call it uh, using a, a very naive scheme, but the point is this, uh, this Cartesian tree is um, the uh, the heap order tree, a binary heap order tree. Yeah. And therefore, uh, not, not all shapes are equivalent. Not all shapes are equally likely. And therefore, so, yeah, so so I think I think I think yeah I think Sebastian Sebastian will, will have a will have, so yes yeah, so I think so it turns out that um, so that's a very good point and I think I think depending on on what what assumptions you make so obviously in the worst case all possible shapes are possible exactly yeah. so is, is, uh, so in the end my 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 question would be uh, from the point of view of uh, the community working on structuring data structures not only that the counting would be uh, well counting, but uh, the, the point is that uh, the expected case will be also uh, something Absolutely. You, uh, you would like to, to hear about, right? Not only enumerative uh, combinatorial. Uh absolutely absolutely yeah. yeah so yeah so I think I think that's absolutely correct and I think I think um, so 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 uh, if, if you were to sort of uh, so so I think for example if, if you had I think I think what would be extremely nice and extremely I think challenging would be if there's some kind of model of, of a string yeah and then you asked what what are the possible mm -hmm. like shapes of, of Cartesian tree that you can get from the, I think that's a very, very interesting and very challenging. But I think just if you just sort of say that you're doing random insertions into it's a, if it's a random binary tree, binary search tree, um, random heap order. So I think I think uh, I think Sebastian Sebastian's paper is actually about about this. So uh, so I, I might just Sebastian. So what what is there is there a notion of a random heap order tree and uh, yeah. what what would be the bound for that? The, the well, I'm not sure about the, the heap order tree. If you go to just random uh, random permutations and build the Cartesian yeah. tree on top of that, that's something we've been we've been doing, and that turns out to be exactly yeah. the random binary search tree shape, which is convenient. So we know the answer for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I think beyond this, we looked a little bit about the range min and max problem that you also mentioned. And if you start with a random permutation there, so the, the worst case bound there, the counting result is known in this case, at least the uh, asymptotic number is, is three n bits. Yeah. But if you start with a random permutation and ask for this, this probabilistic version of the entropy, it's, uh, uh, this problem has bitten me several times 
and I've worked on this for, for four years without any progress. I think this is a really tough one where I'm, I'm doing it <laughs> the wrong way. That seems, yeah. seems tough. So some yeah, so I know. Hairy. Yeah, so I think I think uh, Conrado, I think I think the the other thing which I think is of, of quite interest is 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 the two dimensional one. So I, I looked I looked very briefly at at the um, at the uh, encoding complexity of, of, of an array of two uh, D random um, IID numbers, and uh, that turned out to be at least asymptotically it was fairly easy, but in terms of coming with a precise bound. Uh, it's, 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 that's, to, I think that's totally um, unclear. Yeah. But again, over there, if you come up with a precise bound, then again, because of it's a, supposed to be IID numbers, then one would hope that one can apply some kind of standard machinery and get a data structure, which would, yeah. Here we have another question here in the room by Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question I also posted in the chat, which is, um, so, like um, tree and tree related data structures, they are um, well designed for our, our recursive method and it was on the first to be their recursive structure and the fact that they, they don't cycle like graphs. But graphs, because of the possibility of cycles, they are harder to count with our decomposition method. Mm -hmm. And so, they're like the kind of structure that are particularly. Um, students are desirable to be counted by another means. So my question is, do you have like um, on the top of your mind I, examples of SDS structures that um, store graphs that would help us get better results and better balance with graph time? Oh, yeah, I think I think I think there are some, I mean, I mean I would say that I believe that some of the um, uh, graph representations I mean, if it turns out, if for example, you take a planar graph and then you sort of make subgraphs out of it, all the subgraphs are also going to be planar. So, I think, I think, I think there are some cases where, where it works. And where, where, where I'm, I'm not actually answering the question that you wrote. I'm asking, I'm answering a slightly different question, which is, which is, uh, you know, uh, if you have a counting formula, how does it help you create a data structure? As far as your question is concerned, I mean, I, I don't know. At least the written question, um, SDS will help. Yeah. I mean, they're clearly SDS that that are helped by by a better um, by a better uh, formula for 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 counting class of graphs and so on. Yeah. Okay, and there was one. Uh, I think we have time for one more question in the chat. Alfredo raised his hand. So, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Yes. Sure. Sorry, I, I I have a a question in relation with the model because. Yeah. In information theory, there is very well known definitions of entropy, lower bounds, and the sources, etc. Here you talk about entropy, you talk about effective entropy or whatever, and I don't know the relation with uh, this information theory concepts. What is the relation with optimal values of optimal lower bounds? And I am a bit confused about the model because when you are okay. counting, what you are counting exactly, I mean, I am a bit lost about this. Sorry if the, the question is trivial, but no, no, so, no, I think, I think it, there is a, an important source yeah. that is information theory. And I don't know what exactly fits inside and what do you exactly are counting? Sorry, the question. Uh, you no, know, it's 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 actually absolutely not a trivial question, but but it it I think I think the what we're counting is actually very clear, and the reason it's not a trivial question is because I, I think also sort of goes to some of what what Conrado was asking is is um, so what we're counting is very 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 clear. Okay, so you you have for example you take uh, arrays which contain numbers one to n, and you take equivalence classes of these. Okay, and you want to count the number of equivalence classes. So the counting problem is completely trivial. Uh, now the question is, if you're talking about information theory and entropy, then do you want to assign some kind of probability distribution to, to these equivalence classes? Because the equivalence classes themselves will not be of the same size. So you might ask what probability distribution do you want to assign? And I think figuring out what probability distribution you want to assign to these equivalence classes is, 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 is not always straightforward, I think. So, um, 
yeah so i think i think the uh, i think the notions are all are all completely well defined there is no there is no confusion about the notions i think but i think you're absolutely right in saying that uh in that the uh uh what exactly you choose to count in a given application may not be obvious at first sight yeah so thank you very much. And I think it's now time for the people who are going to the coffee break and whoever wants to still join the, the discussion. I mean, if you want to go on the discussion, I think we can leave it open and anybody who can still wants to discuss can come to the front and you can continue the discussion. So sure. thanks again, Reggie, for this wonderful talk and this very nice application. Thank you so much for inviting me. It, 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 it was my, my great pleasure to, 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 um, um, to attend. I mean, I have, unfortunately, I haven't attended the conference, but it's it's just you know this is the time when we're trying to finish our marking and and all this kind of stuff so it's um, um yeah i do apologize for not being more available but yeah thank, thank you so, so much. we're going to the coffee break and we continue at 10 30.